go to Matthew 2, and we're looking at 13 through 18. Matthew 2, 13. Verse 13, now when they had departed, behold, an angel, that's the Magi, the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Arise. You know, he appeared uh, to the Magi and told him, Don't go back and tell Herod anything. Go a different route home, too, because he's, he's laying in wait for you. Arise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there and I tell, until I tell you. You know how important that is? But I don't know how seriously we take what God tells us. He tells you, he says, I'm telling you to leave and go to Egypt. And when you get to Egypt, I'll tell you when to, to leave Egypt. You, you know what we call that? We call that the directive will of God. And it amazes me how many times people go to church and God tells them what he wants them to do. They know what he, want, they, what he wants them to do and then won't do it. And then get in trouble with the Lord. And, and blame him and think he's a bad God. Of course, if you've raised kids, you know what we're talking about. Arise, take the child as mother, flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. And when he arose and took the child and his mother by night and departed, and, and departed for Egypt, and they were there until the death of Herod, of which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, that the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Out of G Egypt did I call my son. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became enraged, and he sent and slew all the male children, too, who were in uh, Bethlehem and in its uh, vicinity uh, from two years old and under according to the time which he had uh, ascertained from the Magi. Then we get the bigger sign, and that's not enough. We need two or three of them. When the truth of the matter is, all we need is the Word of God and be ob obedient to it. What's wrong with us? Why can't we be obedient to what we hear? I mean, he's got your, he's got your, he's got your back, as they say. He's got your back. And how many times does he have to prove that he's got it? Well, we're going to look at this passage in, from, uh, actually from 16 on, we're going to look at this, and we're going to look at the prophecy. Notice that Herod's intention was to kill the Messiah, to kill the Christ child. But he wasn't quite sure because the Magi didn't come back and tell him exactly where it was. So he didn't want to get, up, get him out. This is how conniving he was. He just circled an area where babies would be born. He said, kill everybody under two and under. Kill every child two and under in that circle. He doesn't know where it is. All he knows is here's Bethlehem. Bethlehem is the smallest city, the smallest town in Judah. He knows from the Magi, Matthew 2, 7, the exact time he was born, so he is able to put a birth date on him. And so when they left and didn't come back, what he did is he just drew a target. And he said, kill every child two and under in that periphery, every child in that area, he, you know, he, he drew off there, it might be five miles, 10 miles, whatever that was, he just drew a circle and said to his soldiers, go in there and, and pull, pull out. Uh, this is not the first time the devil tried to do this. Maybe the first time you heard of it. Uh, he tried to do it in Egypt. Remember that? Killed all the children, right? Kill all the male children. Uh, and uh, the midwives didn't obey it. There's, and so they took Moses and put him in a basket. You know, how, what a famous story that is. But this, is not the, this, is not the, this is not the first time. It won't be the last time. This is, the, the, this is how evil the devil is. 
He disguises himself as good and does evil by it. Disguises himself. Here to build something magnificent and then kill a whole bunch of people. And everybody said, well, he can't be that bad because he just built this wonderful thing. I mean, how bad can he be? He just, he just built an orphanage and then, then turned around and killed all the kids. But how bad could he be? He believed. Well, yeah, he did. Yeah, he should have believed what kind of a king he was, shouldn't he? Yeah, no, he was a bad dude. Now, there's no doubt history records a lot about Herod. He was one bad dude. Well, what is missing by a lot of times when we read Matthew 2, which is one of the great birth stories, Matthew 1 and 2, when we read, we don't pay attention sometimes to the prophecy fulfilled in them. In chapter 2, for example, there are four prophecies fulfilled. I, I listed them for you because they're very important. For example, in Matthew 2, 6, we're told the birthplace of Christ, Micah 5, 2. Now, here's what people miss. Oh, they say, well, Micah 5, 2. They miss who Micah was and why he was there. What you should do on your own, if you're a good Bible student, is go back and if you have a good study Bible, when you open the book of Micah, it'll tell you a lot about the history in the introduction. Agreed? You should read that. Because the prophecy of Micah 5.2 is really important to the time it's to be fulfilled. Right? I mean, God does everything in perfect timing. When God does it, it's perfect timing. Micah, it's really important. When Micah existed as a prophet, made this prophecy. The second prophecy is Matthew 2.15. And that, we just read it. Uh, he said, I want you to get out of here because Herod's going to kill the children and go to Egypt, right? Now, there are a lot of places he's going to send him. He sent him to Egypt to fulfill a prophecy of Hosea. You know what would be important to you? The introduction to Hosea. What was going on in the life of this great prophet in that nation that this prophecy is important? Because if you do, you're going to find out there's something really important that's correlated between Micah and, and Hosea what is going on in the nation of Israel because one prophet is, 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 as you will see here, one is going to talk to the southern kingdom and one is going to talk to the northern kingdom in these prophecies. Then we get to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31.15 is what is quoted in our, our passage about the massacre of the, ch of the Bethlehem children. You know what would be important to you? To go to your study Bible and see when did Jeremiah prophet, who, what was the time in the life of Israel, and what was going on when he made this prophecy? Now you're going to find when you do that, you're going to find something really interesting, and that's what's going on in the lifetime in Israel's history that is prophesying the coming of Christ and what's going to be established. Really, really important. So here we are in Matthew 2.18 when we have this prophecy of Jeremiah 31.15. And what is important is that in Jeremiah 31, it's prophecy, it's messianic prophecy, and in, in Matthew 2.18, it's that prophecy fulfilled. Now what was going on with Jeremiah is the fifth cycle of divine discipline to Israel in 586 B.C. to Babylon. And what is missing in maybe your study of this is what the prophecy said. So I want you to do something with me. Well, I'm starting, my engine's starting to get revved up. Let me have a word of prayer. Let's have a word of prayer. I give you a moment of silence as a believer, priest, classroom etiquette. 
be sure you can't study the Bible in carnality, identity of carnality. How do you identify carnality? Mental attitude, sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. What do I do? I've got to confess them through my priesthood, 1 Peter 2. Confess them through my priesthood, 1 John 1 9. If I confess my sins, here's what God has promised me He is faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me. The cleansing extends the work of Christ from the cross to the Christian life in dealing with personal sin, not Adam's sin. And personal sin hinders the ministry of the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit. What is important in Bible study is he's going to teach you. He's going to, he's going to impress upon your soul the importance of believing what you're hearing because it develops faith, and faith sets you free from the cosmic system of false beliefs. So I give you a moment. Confess your sin. Could be mental attitudes. It could be sin of the tongue or overt. Take a moment in your priesthood. Can make confession. And then pray that God would speak to your heart and teach you some great truths here tonight. And so our Father, we're thankful for those who have come our way by automobile and those by internet. We pray that those on the internet would have the same courtesy of classroom. Turn off the 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 things that would be distracting and focus for the next uh, 45, 50 minutes with us on this subject matter about the second Christmas. Alice Presley sang a song about blue per Christmas and uh, there was never a blue Christmas like this one unless you had Christ and there is no such thing as a blue Christmas if you have Christ because it works all things together for good to those who love God for those who are called according to his purpose, there's always a good Christmas. So we pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to see something important. I want you to go to Jeremiah. I want you to hold your place in Matthew. And then find, find a Jeremiah in the Old Testament. You know, you get to Isaiah, then you're going to get to Jeremiah. You, you go too far, you get into Lamentations, all that stuff. I'm looking at Jeremiah 31. I want 31.15. 31.15. Got it? All right, I'll give you a moment. Look, it's important you put your eyes on the Word. You know what? You, you know what pleases God's heart? I think what John said when he wrote to wrote wrote back in the third third John, he said, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the joy that I have is when I see my children walk in the truth of the word of God. I'll tell you, you want to bring you want to bring some joy this Christmas, God? Open the scriptures and then be open to the scriptures that are open to you. Uh, here is um here is uh, thirty one fifteen. If you have a study Bible, you'll see that we're in the New Covenant. Uh, we're, we're headed to the New Covenant, uh, which starts in verse 27. But here we are. <clears throat> Thus saith the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentations and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her, for her children because they are no more. Are you with me? You say, well, that sounds like what it does in Matthew, right? All right, let's take a look. Over into Matthew uh, 2.18. We have to look back at 17. Then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, she refused to be comforted because they were no more. Right? What is different? Oh, yeah. The wording is different. No. I'll tell you the difference. It's a big one, too. I'll tell you the difference. Look at Jeremiah 31, 15. You know what it says? It says, thus saith the Lord. That's not Matthew. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you know what thus saith the Lord? Me? You remember how we've been doing truly, truly, I say unto you by Jesus? Well, when you're in the old covenant and, he, and it says, thus the Lord says, you're in as a big a deal as you are when Jesus saying in the book of John 25 times, 
Truly, truly, I say unto you, this is as big a deal when he says that. Now, let me tell you what that means in synopsic terms. What this means is decreed. Thus saith the Lord. The Lord, thus saith the Lord, is what is decreed, and heaven and hell is not going to change it. You understand? There are all the king's horses and all the king's men not going to put Humpty Dumpty together again. It means it's decreed by the word of God and it's going to happen. All right? It's decreed, right? Now, every time you read that in the Old Testament, thus saith the Lord, thus the Lord says, that means that that's, that's decreed by God. It ain't ever going to change until it's fulfilled. It's going to be fulfilled. Nothing, nothing in life. And boy, a lot of stuff was going on in Jeremiah 31. People were being murdered in the street by a foreign power that had invaded them. And, and their children would be carried off into bondage to a foreign land. And this is what he's talking about. And he's, he's Jeremiah is telling them in the, in the history when it will actually happen. Yeah, you understand that? That God has decreed that this will happen. And ever, before they invaded, everybody was going, oh, what a stupid prophet. Always talking this way. Eh, what a stupid guy. Until it came. And then when it came, they wanted to kill him for bringing them bad news. What he's decreed. Now, now watch how that's interpreted. What, what, let's go back to Matthew. You understand this now, right? Now watch how that's interpreted. Thus saith the Lord. Watch how thus saith the Lord is interpreted. Right? 17. In verse 17. Then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled that said. You understand that? In other words, what does that mean? It means that that which was decreed by God that nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing but God himself will change that decree has been fulfilled 500 years later. Right? And Matthew, Matthew, the second chapter, is saying to us, that what God has decreed will be fulfilled. And if it is fulfilled in your lifetime, there is a lot connected to it that you should know. Now, what was connected 500 years earlier in the Rama experience was the real fifth cycle of national discipline when Israel fell to a foreign country. And God signed off on it. It was called the fifth cycle of divine discipline of Deuteronomy 28. What was fulfilled in that was a wonderful thing. It was the birth of Christ, right? And yet with the birth of Christ, this most wonderful event in all of human history had this terrible tag attached to it. Agreed? What was the tag? What was the fulfillment? The children in Bethlehem would die. Now, we didn't know it. We didn't know it was Bethlehem, right? It didn't tell you, it, did, Jeremiah, did Jeremiah 31, 15 tell you it was? Huh? Where, did it say, where did it say this was going to occur? When was Rachel, the mother of Israel, Jacob being the father of Israel, and Rachel being the mother of Judah, we're talking about Judah, what, what, what was that? Why was she weeping? She was weeping for her children, it, right? This is Jerusalem. This is, this, is, this is all of Israel. This is Rachel, the mother of all of Israel, especially Judah. Agreed? Judah. That's what Jeremiah was dealing with. The north kingdom was already gone. The, you know, the ten tribes were already gone. Hosea talked about that. Uh -huh. 
Hosea talked about that. You see any of this? And so we have this, the birth of Jesus Christ, which is the most wonderful event. The Magi come and, and the angels come. Joy to the world, right? Our Savior has been born. And the Magi show up and say, the King of the Jews is Savior. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Savior of mankind has been born. And yet there's this prophetic tag uh, that said, that, that with this birth will come this decree. In Rhema. But it, but you say, but Bethlehem is not Rhema. No, it's not. No, it's not. And we're going to talk about that tonight. So that's the one we're going to talk about tonight. While I'm still on this subject matter, the fourth prophecy in Matthew 12 that's really important people miss as well. They miss this prophecy in, in Matthew 2.23, and what they miss about it is that it's called the prophets, not the prophecy. It's called the prophets. It's plural in verse 23. I don't want to get into that tonight because I don't want to get away from my subject. And came and resided in a city called Nazareth that was spoken through the what? It's plural might be fulfilled. He's called a Nazarene. It's, it's a prophetic concept. And I wish I had time, but I gave you some key passages for you to read and understand about it. Now, here's what's interesting to me as a pastor. Many Bible teachers shy away from this Christmas story because it's a story of families in great grief. And so they, I mean, I mean, this will put a, a bad mood on your Christmas. I mean, everybody's going, everybody's going to funerals. There's no, there's no joy to the world being sung on the second Christmas. Uh, there's, there's no lights going on. Everything is dark. There's black flowers on the doors. If you, got, if you see a reef, it's, it's, it's death. So nobody wants to talk about it. I mean, you're not going to hear a sermon on this. Not unless you go to church like mine. They're going to hear it because they, they don't want to set a bad mood. But listen, it can't be bad. God works all things for good. How can it be bad? Now, I can't tell you that until the last day breath is in my body because it's hard for you to believe this because you think bad things happen to good people. Not if they're saved. You live in a whole different mindset of life. Don't let the devil lie to you. Romans 8, 28 applies to your life when you apply it, but it stands ready. So let's talk about four things tonight about the Christmas lamentation. You know why it's called a lamentation? Because the word lamentation is used where? In Jeremiah 31, 15. Right? It's lamentation. The Christmas massacre was prophesied in the passage in the in this very passage in the book of Jeremiah, known as this passage is known as Lamentations. Jeremiah wrote this book, and because of Lamentations, wrote another book. Thanks. Your policeman is always on duty. <laughs> Ready to serve the widows and the orphans and the pastors. It was Jeremiah that wrote the book called what? Lamentations. And here's a sneak preview of the Lamentations right here. It's a preview of the book of Lamentations called the Lamentations. The Christmas massacre at Bethlehem is the last recorded biblical cruel act of Herod, biblically, before he died in 4 B.C., and this is really important for dating the birth of Christ. Because Herod is going to kill these kids and God's going to take them out. And so we know that Jesus, and, we, and he's killed everything to and under, right? Yes. To make sure. So 
So we've we've got we've got a date narrowed down pretty good. Would you agree with that? You know he wasn't born in four. So it's somewhere between four and six. Okay, just just saying. Uh, Clark in his book, uh, commentary on the book of Matthew, that I read many years ago. He 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 writes, and it's pretty true. I mean, you can read historical books and get the same every Joseph and people like this. But the last month of Herod's life was filled with, and this is what we're talking about. This this that's going to occur in Matthew is in the very la latter part of his life. He go kill these kids, and God's going to say, "That's it, done." The last month of Herod's life was filled with acts of cruelty. He murdered forty zealots, and his last son. He killed, he killed his wives, and I mean, this guy, he was, you know, authority does strange things to people, doesn't he? Because he had, had the power. Well, anyhow, he ain't got more power to God, though. He's going to find out he's not a big chuck when it comes to God. There is a, the Feast of the Holy Innocents is celebrated on December the 28th in remembrance of this Christmas massacre of Bethlehem male children by Herod. It is celebrated by the Roman Catholics, the Anglicans, and the, Ch Ch and the Greek Orthodox churches, just in case sometime you might. I know Johnny has some people in the Greek Orthodox. This is uh, celebrated by them, and uh, so we ought to acknowledge that. In Jeremiah 30, 15, it, in Jeremiah, it says the Lord, thus saith the Lord, as I mentioned. Now, here's what's interesting. See the word voice? It's singular. It's singular. It's not plural. Now, you know there were a lot of voices. There were so many voices. There were so many voices weeping, mourning in deep grief that it sounded like one great sound. Can you imagine? I mean, we can imagine this, can we not? Can you imagine a soldier uh, breaking your door down and taking your male child out and killing it? I mean, that's uh, an Israelite killing an Israelite is about as bad as it gets. A voice was heard in Ramah, a voice, it's singular. L lamentations and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Here's the second point. In Jeremiah 31, 15, pay attention to me now, there's a triple application in biblical history. And the only people that know this are us, usins. Because we live in, in the, the ability to see the whole big picture because we live in the completion of the canon. There is no more revelation than what we have in the scriptures today. That's it. The secret is understanding what we have that God wants revealed. And this is a magnificent thing. And I want to show you the three things that's in this. I want to show you three things. First, the fifth cycle of divine discipline to Judah in 586 B.C., that's when Jeremiah, that's what Jeremiah was talking about, okay? He, that's what he was preaching to his congregation, and they were, and, and, and listen, he heard the troops coming down the streets and said, this is it, guys, and they marched right through the, the building and took the people. You understand that? I mean, he was... He was breathing this out as people, as the soldiers were marching down the streets, carrying off people. That's the first thing. The, the biblical reality, he was going to see this occur to his people. And listen, they captured him or made him a POW. And the most interesting story in the book of Jeremiah, to me at least, being a pastor, was how he got off. You should read how they left him in the land. And by leaving him in the land, he became the pastor of sending doctrines 
into the young people like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. He was their senior pastor feeding them. And then God sent his associate pastor into that mess in Ezekiel. Uh, it's a magnificent story. And you should read how God took him and took him right out of their grasp and set him right back into Israel to be that, that senior pastor for these people over here. And he just fed them doctrine after doctrine into that. It's a magnificent story. Oh, it's well worth a read. Oh, it's well worth a read. The second thing that occurred, the second thing occurred is our Christmas Lamentations of Bethlehem in uh, 4 BC. And we, we've read that in Matthew 2. The third one was future to the birth of Christ. It was 70 AD. This one prophecy has three connections to Judah, who's going to go under two fifth cycles of discipline. One in 586, God's going to bring him back and then take him out again. He's going to bring him back for the birth of Christ and take him out because they crucified him. We're just a dumb group of people, best I can tell you. Apart from the Word of God, we're not dumb, we're not dumb when we're in the Word of God because God's a genius and he, he, he can take the dumbest guy and make a genius out of him if he study the Word of God. You can, you can get 15 diplomas and still be the dumb guy. And you can have no college degree and be the smart guy because you study the Word of God. So if you want to read about that fifth that was coming, Jesus preached, there's a fifth coming to you. There's a fifth coming to you. Jesus preached it, right? Oh, my goodness, he preached it. I wrote it down in Luke 19, 41 through 44, Luke 23, 27 through 21, 31. I mean, it just gives you, you go in there and read that, and you go, like, he was preaching, boy, it's coming. They're coming, they're coming to get us again. And they just, they wouldn't listen. They, they were still not listening to him when they, they marched through the streets of Jerusalem and killed everybody, just like in the day of Jeremiah. History repeats itself, doesn't it? Especially to dumb people. All right? And I mean dumb. I don't mean any. I'm, I'm talking spiritually now. I'm not talking about. I mean, right? Smart people. Smart people get saved. Smart people study the Bible. Smart people believe that God's smarter than anybody in the whole wide world. It is to me. The fifth cycle of divine discipline on Judah, both in 586 and then 70 A.D., brought great suffering to the poor, the elderly, and the children, as you might imagine. Deuteronomy 28 talks about it, and he talks about how divine blessing uh, turns into discipline and how discipline can turn back into blessing. You think about this. You, t you talk about the people who were carried away into, into Babylonian discipline. Uh, uh, look how God turned their life into favor, into grace. You know, when you see in the Old Testament, God showed favor. Even, even in, the, in the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, it says God showed favor. It means that his grace shined upon them so strong that other people could see it. That's favor. I mean, grace is one thing. I mean, you have grace because of the work of Christ. But when, when you get a hold of grace, grace shines out of you and it becomes God's favor. I mean, people see that you've been favored. Did they not see it in Joseph's life? Did they not see it in uh, uh, Daniel's life? I mean, we've, we've just recently studied that. Listen, and the same thing is true for you and me. When you embrace grace and you begin to believe that grace is sufficient, that, that grace it works in every circumstance, that this is the miracle of our dispensation, the work of grace in our life, and it becomes favor, God opens that up in your life where it is the most important thing in your life. Saving grace, logistical grace, growing grace, suffering grace, dying grace, surpassing grace. When all of that, it fits in your life and like that, and that favor of God is upon your life and you're living out the grace of God by favor, that favor is seen by everybody that is interested in the truth of God. You look at the life of Joseph, if you doubt that, every place he went, 
God's favor flowed from uh, where? It didn't matter if he was in a free enterprise. It didn't matter if, if he was in prison. It didn't matter if, if he was in uh, a political person. He never changed his character to fit who he, what he was doing. Oh, I'm in prison. <laughs> no, he just took it and embraced it and went God's grace. Boom. And then they, pff, he owned it. You get nothing else from my ministry. Get grace. Find the favor of God in your life so that others can find it from you. Um, listen to Deuteronomy when he talks about the fifth cycle of discipline to a nation. In Deuteronomy 28, 50, when he talks about Israel, he says, a nation of fierce countenance who will have no respect for the old, nor show favor to the young, to the children. You know who that was? Listen, it was every nation that ever marched through Israel. It was true of Babylon. It was true for Babylon. It was true from Rome. When you drew a sword on Rome, and they drew their sword on you, they were pretty decent people until you did that. Babylon too. If you pull the sword on Babylon, they, listen, they fought to give up their kingdom if they couldn't get yours. There's only one title going to come out of this war. When Babylon fought you, they fought, their whole kingdom fought you. And I'll either own your kingdom or your own mine and bring it on. They were fierce people. And the, listen, you know who made them fierce warriors? God, in order to be able to take a nation like Israel. God. You do know God controls everything, don't you? Well, then you ought to read Ecclesiastes 3. You ought to read Ecclesiastes 3. Well, anyhow, that's kind of important. During the Babylonian captivity of 586, now here's how Rhema comes in. Who, where is this Rhema? Rhema was the final collecting and processing of all POWs before the final leg to Babylon. Jeremiah 40, 1 through 3. That, you read it on your own. It's, it's okay. But you should read it on your own time. And you ought to, you ought to, be, you ought to see. Uh, and there's more to it. I just gave you three verses. That kind of it. But Rhema was what, the last place where they conquered. They always had a processing place. And from there... You were going to go to a certain thing. Well, there they screened you. And uh, they took a good look at medically, intelligence, all that stuff. And they evaluated. It's, it's kind of like the Army does it. When I got drafted, that's what they did with me. I went through a processing. That's it. They sent me to a processing center. And they checked you all kinds of, they checked you physically, they checked you mentally, educationally, they gave you all kinds of tests, and then they said, hey, this is what you're going to do. I was lucky, because I had just gotten saved months prior. And so God was looking out over my, because I was dumb as a brick. Then the Lord said, it, 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 these POWs were composed largely of young Jews like Daniel. The very old, they left in the land. The poor, they left in the land because they let them, let them, let them die. I, they're not worth killing. Let, leave them alone. Just let them die. You know, it's kind of like let the animals have them. So they had this process in the last place. How you processed is where you went when you went to Babylon. That was Rhema. Rhema. And right there, a lot would be separated. And listen, there would be some that were processed here that were sent back. They would find, look, no, you've got a disease. We can't take you. You're going back. So you're going back to die. They processed. Some went home to die. 
They couldn't make the last lake or they didn't want to take them, whatever. They took the cream of the crop. That was at Ramah. That was Ramah. That was Ramah. Listen. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has, he's talking about Job, all that he has is in your, is in your power. Only do not put your hands, put forth your hands on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. I tell you that because, listen, here we are in Bethlehem. And he makes a comparison to Ramah. The processing center. You know what Judas stood for? Do you know what Judas stood for in the fifth cycle to Babylon? You know what he stood for? The Messiah. He's going to come from the tribe of Judah, from the house of David, from the lineage, right? Yeah. But you know, that's all about God and all about what he wants done. And nobody, even as big as Babylon, is not going to, is not going to dwarf that plan. And now, now we're, the similarity is, now we're in Bethlehem. We got, the, we got the reason Judah is in existence all these years, why there's been a remnant. And now there's another attack upon the Messiah. As soon as Herod hears that, Herod, because he works for Satan, not for God, is out to kill him. Right? But here's what you have to know about Satan. I'm going to read it again. The Lord said to Satan. You know why it says that? It's not what Satan says to him that's important. It's what he says to him <laughs> that's important. You know, the Lord says to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Do not. And so he puts restrictions on him. And you know why? You know what Satan understands? I can't go beyond that restriction. Why? Boom. One greater than you. Boom. Right? First John 4, 4. You know what he says? Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Boom. We have more power in us than the devil and his entire army. Boom. But do you know that? Do you know that you have more power in you because of the Holy Spirit than Satan and his entire army. He's got a third of the angels with him. Boom! Don't matter. One blow from God and the whole thing's over. Boom! Why don't we know that? So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. Listen, he can't go, listen, he can't do, he can't do what you can't, listen, he can't do what you can't do either. You cannot destroy the will of God. Whatever the will of God for your life is, is going to be done or you're going to be done. One of them is going to get done. He don't have no power over your life, but what you give him, let him have no leeway in your life. The Bible says don't let him get a foot hold in your life. Don't let him stick his big toe in your door. He comes knocking on your door and you say, what you selling? He, he says, evil, but you love it. Slam that door on his toe. <laughs> Satan's attack upon the Bethlehem, three, Satan's attack upon the Bethlehem male children, two and under, is an attempt to kill Jesus, right? I mean, he said it, didn't he? Herod said I'm going to kill him. So he sends his army out there. Listen, how did this all start? Way back in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> in Genesis 3.15, the woman will have a seed and Satan will fight that seed to the bitter end. Fourth chapter, first male child, then the second male child. The first male child kills the second male child because the second male child is born again in the first one. And boom. And, and listen, right? Cain killed uh, 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 Abel, right? But you know what 1 John 3, 12 says? Satan, Satan got him to kill his brother with a sacrificial knife. His grave still preached. 
Yeah, it is, yeah, uh, yeah. As long as you got earth. Well, anyhow. It shows how evil fallen mankind can become apart from grace, salvation of Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 17, 9. In Revelation, the 20 chapter, verse 7, the devil who deceived them. See, that's his name of the game. He appears as an angel of light to deceive you. You know how you check him out? What's the word say? What's the Bible say? You got him. What's the Bible say? Now, if you don't know what the Bible says, he loves that, right? Oh, he'll, he'll dance with you for an hour. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet, now we're in the tribulation, are also, see the fifth cycle of 70 AD is still got, is still got more to come. All right. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now that's a long time forever and ever. You know, when somebody gets married, the best they can do is say until death do us part. You know, they won't even say that now. <laughs> Every once in a while, I sneak it in. No, they say, I'm not going to have that death till. How do I know that? Well, one, one of them is going to die if they leave, right? <laughs> I'll crank up the car. I mean, somebody. <laughs> till death do his part. I said it. Did you say it at your wedding? I, I'm just shocked. I mean, uh, yeah. Not I didn't well, know everybody does well, that. Well, no, because nobody believes that. Nobody believes that anymore. Doesn't believe you're you're married till death to his part. Well, I do. I believe it. Yeah, I do too. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I've considered that a, a couple of times in my life. Till death to his part. I'm just kidding. Just kidding, Jane. <laughs> just kidding. Can't you take a kid? No, I can hear her say right now. What what did he say? Did, what did he say? I didn't really say it, honey. Don't listen to him. <laughs> Satan, listen, Satan promotes evil as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11. The only rule he must obey is the same as you and I, the will of God. Huh? We know that from Job, do we not? He can't stretch it. I mean, he, he can't, listen, he knows he has to obey it, so he tries to lie to us to get us not to obey it. Is he not, is he not a mess? Why would we listen to him one hour? I don't know. It's a covenant, isn't it? You got that right. Here's my final point. Raymond and Bethlehem were both placed into biblical messianic history by giving the prophetic testimony to the faithfulness of God into his word amidst great Jewish messianic tragedy. How, how did these two get linked up? Isn't that interesting? This is a really interesting passage. How did that, how did you link those two up in prophecy? How did that thing in Rama, which was really a, a literal place, with a literal event of, of great tragedy, how did that get linked up with Bethlehem? Isn't that interesting? I'll tell you, I'll tell you the common link. Not just that they're both going to go through a lot of tragedy, but the, the, the link is fifth cycle. If you paid attention, I said there are three things that are in this prophecy, then that makes sense. But you know what's the greatest point of this? is not all the tragedy. It's the faithfulness of God to his word. It was decreed in Jeremiah, and, and now we see it fulfilled in Bethlehem. What happened in Ramah is happening in is the, the processing center. And, and God protects who he wants to protect, doesn't he? And everything is going to fall according to the schedule. Ecclesiastes 3.3, 3, there in God's perfect timing, it all falls under God's perfect timing in the great master plan of the plan of God. I mean, sometimes it's hard for us to believe because we, we're finite. We can see it when we look. Look, we're looking down the corridor back here of 500 years. Now here we are. We're 2,000 years out. We're looking back to, to uh, 4 B.C., which is looking back to 586, right? 
I mean, look at, look at the advantage we have by the very time in which we live to be able to look down there and actually, absolutely understand that. That's pretty amazing to me. That we, I mean, I feel like I really understand that. That's pretty amazing. I don't know if there's any piece of history I know that much about and believe that deeply in it. That's pretty amazing to me. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. So I want us to really get this idea. Faithful is he who calls you, and he will also bring it to pass. So I think that's important that we know that. I think that's really important. Listen, he is faithful, and he will bring it to pass. He is faithful, and he will bring it to pass. What's my job? My job is to stay faithful with him, and then let him, let him bring it to pass. Sometimes we get really anxious because it's not really coming on our schedule. It, you know, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Paid day, come on, paid day, come on, come on, come on. What do you mean I got fired? I, I talked to a guy. I talked to a guy over the Christmas holiday. Uh, the, the boss came in uh, a few days before Christmas, says, you're gone. El zippo nothing. Merry Christmas. Now, what are you going to do with that? Said that to you? <laughs> no, nobody said that to me. I, this guy came in and was telling me that this is what happened to him. No, I didn't. Who's going to fire me? I work for God. I don't work for people. I ain't never worked for, I never had a job since I left Billy Graham or anybody. I don't work for anybody. I'm just thankful that somebody puts a nickel in the pot and we live on a nickel. I don't care. None of that means anything to me. I don't want to get fired by God now, I tell you. I'm not, I'm not looking forward to that idea. In 1 Corinthians 1 9, God is faithful. Boy, I mean, is this not a theme? God is faithful to whom you were called. There's your second point. You were called. How do you know you're called? Well, you're sitting here today. You just got like, well, I believe that Jesus died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead. Hot diggity dog, you're called. Now that's idea called to what? Yeah, we're children. The call is a big deal. But, you know, so what, what, why am I still here? Why, what, what, what does God want me to do? Now, this takes spiritual growth. It takes a little spiritual growth to figure that out. Right? God is faithful. God is faithful. It's always about God is faithful. It's going to take you a while to get there. But once you get there, he expects you to be that. And when, he, and when you do, then this idea of faith and grace is going to be transferred to faith, grace, favor. And when it hits favor, because now you're beginning to see the bigger picture in your life when it turns to turns to, where grace is established in my life. I live, I walk by faith and not by sight. I, I live, I am dependent on God for everything I have physically, mentally, and spiritually, financially. And when that becomes resolved within me, I live in the favor. I'm one of the favored of God. And sometimes we have to be told that. Mary had to be told. Mary was, Mary was right on the money, a spiritual mature person. And the angel had to come and say, when it came to her specific calling, it, he had to say, you've been chosen to show favor. Okay? And boy, did she ever. Did she ever. And, and listen, that's, that's what you, that's what, and when it does, the spotlight shine, and you don't care about it, it shines off. You're not working for the spotlight. But when grace, when, when grace becomes the way of life through faith, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself, it is work of God, not, right? It's the work of God, not of man. Once that clicks in into my everyday processing of my life, I have found the favor of God. 
And when I have, the spotlight goes out from me, and I don't even know it. Not looking for it. It's, I've got blinders on myself on it. Highly flavored. There you go. Listen, we all are at some point highly favored. But, you know, listen, and she still is that like, well, I still don't understand this. And he said, well, let me tell you what, what it's about. See? But listen, look, at we're all, because of her favored, we've all been favored as we grow in the Word of God. That's, that's the important point that I want to get to. Our thing. But as a pastor, I want to conclude, as, as a pastor, our lesson text is reality and so many families going through the Christmas without a loved one. The, the reason this passage is important to me as a passage, the reason I would preach this above most any passages on Christmas is because I know there are so many families that go through the loss of a loved one at the Christmas time and, is, and it really is gut-wrenching. And listen, over, over my life, I've seen people really struggle, struggle through the Christmas season because of the loss of a loved one by death, by divorce, by distance, and by disagreements. And their families. This. And so for me, this is a passage of great hope. Listen, this is a passage of grief. But, but listen, God is greater than that. Right? God is greater than that. I mean, he's the one that can turn your grief at Christmas into joy. We're told that the angel said, joy to the world for a Savior has been born to you today in the city of David. And listen, that has got to be an important message after these children were killed and, and all of that. The joy that a Savior has been born in Bethlehem. This, the fact that the joy... And sometimes we forget that God is faithful in our life to bring us the joy. The joy is not in the loss. The joy is in God that takes care of the loss in our life. Right? And, and the ministry... The ministry of the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. I mean, it's not something you have to long and beg for. It's something you just re release of the Holy Spirit in your life. The, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, right? I mean, this is, this is released in our life by, because of the favor that we have with God. He will bring us the joy, even though it's very sad and very difficult during these times. He will bring you the joy of the season. He'll bring it back to you. He will do it supernaturally when it can't be done naturally. That's a marvelous thing in my mind. So for me, I know that many in my church, I mean, I just did a funeral five days before Christmas uh, and did one prior to that two weeks before it. And I see this, and I see it's not just death that brings, but divorce. I see people that have gone through divorce. It brings great sadness during this time. Families are all messed up. Children are all messed up. And sometimes distance, people can't get back, and there's sadness on both parts. Sometimes families get in disagreements, which is silly stuff. Just silly stuff. Let it not be the Christian in the group. You're bigger than that. You're bigger than that. Your God is bigger than that. You have Philippians 4, 6, and 7. You have James 1, 2 through 4. You have, the, you have Galatians 5, 22, 23. Embrace these. Be God is greater. Let God do the stuff. Don't try to go in there and fix people. Go in there and love them in the, in the power of Christ and, and, and be what they cannot be. Be assured that God understands the loss of a loved one from your life. Like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave up his only begotten son. Whoever believed in him would not perish. But God demonstrated his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's love, my dear friends. There's love. There's, there's the love that made sacrifices in their own uh, health care love. 
the, the love that makes me feel better, the love that makes somebody else feel better. I mean, that's, I mean, how good is that? Because of God's grace, these suffering Bethlehem children and families were memorialized in the eternal word of God. Think about that. I don't know who these people were. But listen, for every person that lost a child in that great vicinity, for every one of them, God, God put their name in the book of life. For every one of them, he put their name in the book of life and then put it in the word of God forever. So while I don't know their name, I will know their name. He, he, he memorialized them in the word of God. And so he does for each one of us, for each one of us who believe in his son. Well, let Alva sing the blue ones and you keep joy to the world. Keep joy to the world. Let us pray. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to come and speak on behalf of the children of Bethlehem. Speak the truth about a caring, loving Savior. To show the faithfulness of God to his decrees and still can bring something good out of it. The good that's found in Christ. We know this Christmas there are people that have to go through adjusting to life without a loved one through death or divorce, distance, disagreements. What a loving Heavenly Father that understands our pain and knows how to comfort us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God with, with groanings that are too deep for words. May we fall upon our face before a loving, caring, nurturing God that will heal every heartache and restore us into favor through grace by faith. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.